Um, so thank you all for listening and giving me this opportunity to talk to you all today about the Southern Interior Mule Deer Project. And I would like to first acknowledge that I am presenting to you from the traditional territory of the Seal people. And so this research forms the basis of my PhD dissertation research, but it's also the largest collaborative mule deer uh, research project in BC's history. And so I'd also like to start by acknowledging all of our other collaborators, because this work truly couldn't happen without, um, without everyone involved. So we'll start first with the Ministry of Forest Lands, Natural Resource Operations and Rural Development, um, particularly the uh, Wildlife Branch, the Okanagan Nations Alliance, the BC Wildlife Federation, and the University of Idaho. So I'm going to start off with a little outline just so you can see where I'm going with this presentation. And also, uh, if you've heard me give a talk before, the beginning of this will sound really similar. Uh, so feel free to forward uh, right through about halfway through the presentation where I start getting into some of the results. Um, but I just want everyone to know kind of where we're going. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is why we even want to study mule deer here in BC. To some of you, this is pretty obvious, but maybe not to everybody. Uh, then I'm going to talk about mule deer research uh, in other regions and what they've found. Then I'll start getting into our study, where it's taking place and, and what we're doing. And yeah, then get more into the methods. So how we catch mule deer and then what information we are collecting from those deer. Then I'll get into the results where I'll talk about preliminary survival data and then some movement and migration information. So those are all the results I have to share with you guys. So if you were hoping, if you were tuning in and hoping that I finally have some answer about, you know, what's driving mule deer populations, um, I don't have that quite yet. Uh, this project, we're over half, halfway through. Um, I've been a part of the project for about two years now, over two years, uh, but we still have about two years left to go. So we're right in the middle. We're towards the end of data collection and moving into data analysis. And so I would just like to remind everyone that um, good things come to those who wait. And if you can just wait a little bit longer, I will have uh, much better results for you in coming in coming years than I do right now. But um, yeah, and then my last slide will just be about all the things that I still have left to do. Um, yeah, so why would we even want to research mule deer uh, to begin with? And uh, as obviously, hopefully most people know, they're a highly valued game species here in BC. So a study was conducted in 2013 in which a group interviewed resident hunters throughout BC and they found that 75% of them sought to harvest at least one deer every year. They also found that those hunters spent about $130 million a year hunting deer. And so to put that in perspective, that's about 35% of the total annual expenditures on hunting in the province. Mule deer are also a vital part of the ecosystem. So beyond just being um, a tasty treat for everyone to eat, they are a native species here to BC and an important prey species for many predators. So they're a really vital part of the food web in British Columbia. And lastly, mule deer are also an important source of food security and cultural practice uh, for First Nations communities. And so we can see that mule deer are a highly valued game species or just a highly valued species in general, excuse me, uh, for multiple stakeholder groups throughout the province. However, mule deer populations are suspected to be declining in the southern interior of BC, with declines in some areas dating as far back as the 1950s. And so unfortunately, it's really difficult to get population estimates of deer, uh, particularly in a heavily forested area like BC, uh, right? You can't go out and just count them all from a helicopter like you might in Wyoming. Um, it's, it's pretty forested and, and you're really likely to miss a lot of deer that way. Uh, so we often have to rely on other indices to help show trends in deer population size. And so these data sources include things like yearly harvest numbers and even anecdotal reports. So if we look at um, mule deer harvest numbers in Region 8, and so Region 8 extends from west of Princeton to east of Grand Forks, and then from the U.S. border to north of Enderby, if we look at these mule deer harvest numbers, we can see that from the early 90s to the early 2000s, there's a decline of about 50% in the number of mule deer harvested from this region. So in the early 90s, there were over 5,000 deer harvested to a low in 1999 of just above 2,500. And so this doesn't tell us that the mule deer population declined by 50% during this time period, but it does tell us that there is likely, there was likely a decline happening in the region. Um, and we also suspect that mule deer populations are not declining in similar ways throughout all of the southern interior. There are certainly areas that um, seem to be doing better and others that perhaps are doing worse. And it might seem obvious that uh, one 
way to deal with declining deer numbers would simply be to limit the, the harvest and then the, the deer population would recover. But as I'm sure many of you know, hunting regulations have become more restrictive over the years, uh, but these declines in deer numbers are thought to be continuing. And so before we get too far into um, other research in, in, the, uh, in the US, um, I just want to take us back to population biology and think about the most important factors or age cohorts that um, influence population growth. So for mule deer, um, one of the number one uh, parameters that influences um, deer population growth is adult female survival. And previous studies have shown that adult female survival is generally high and constant between years. And this is really important. So that means that once deer make it through their first year of life and they become an adult, um, particularly the, the females, then they're alive and they stay alive uh, to reproduce for the future. Um, but yeah, so the other cohort that's really important for us to understand is the survival of juvenile deer. So from the, the time they're born until they're one year old, that survival can be incredibly low and can also be really variable between years. And so this is one of the most important uh, parameters for us to understand if we're trying to understand if deer populations are growing or declining. Um, and then the last thing, of course, is pregnancy rates of adult and yearling females. So for an adult female to be productive or to help the, the future deer population, they have to be pregnant uh, and producing um, juveniles each year. And so I just wanted to, to start off with this so that you understand why we are collaring and focusing on the age and sex cohorts that we are. So adult females and then females. So there's been a number of mule deer studies conducted in recent years, uh, particularly in the US, but they do give us some idea of what might be the main limiting factors in mule deer populations. So they include um, food, predators, landscape change, and weather or annual climate variation. So perhaps the more, most important limiting factor identified in these studies is food or forage quality and availability. So a study was conducted in the early 2000s in Colorado in which they had two uh, populations of deer and they were alike in as many ways as they possibly could. This was a natural experiment. So obviously no two populations are completely identical, but they had similar habitats, similar predator densities, similar population densities of deer. Um, and in one of the populations, they uh, supplementally fed the deer during the winter time and in the other population, they did nothing. Uh, and then they monitored survival of adults and juvenile deer to see what happened. And what they found was that in the supplementally fed population, there was an increase in juvenile overwinter body size and an increase in adult and juvenile survival. And these increases in survival led to an actual greater population growth um, in the supp supplementally fed population, which translated to about an extra 6,000 deer being added to the population each year. And I'd like to point out, so the reason this study decided to do supplemental feeding was because this was an experiment and they were trying to see if food limitation on winter range was one of the driving forces behind uh, their deer populations. And so they did supplemental feeding as an experiment. Um, supplemental feeding is not, uh, it's actually quite a poor management strategy for long term. Um, so since this study was completed, uh, the folks in Colorado have been trying to uh, manipulate habitat quality through habitat management to actually increase forage quality on, um, on deer winter ranges without, without supplemental feeding. So predators are often thought to be a main limiting factor in mule deer populations, uh, but recent work shows that predation is unlikely to be as important to mule deer survival as forage quality and quantity. So in Idaho, researchers conducted another experiment where again, they had two different populations of deer, actually there's more than two, um, <clears throat> and they had treatment areas and then control areas. And again, these populations were really similar uh, in as many ways as they could. But in the treatment areas, they removed as many coyotes and cougars as they possibly could. And in the control areas, they did nothing except monitor survival and recruitment. And so what they found was that even after removing up to 75% of the coyotes and 94% of the cougars in an area, survival and population growth of deer did not increase by a significant amount. So they did find that in some of the coyote removal areas over the summer, uh, neonate survival was higher, but then in the wintertime, all of those extra neonates uh, essentially died during the wintertime. And so then there wasn't really any increase in that full year survival 
of juvenile deer, and so it didn't really translate into an increase in survival. Sorry, I meant to I meant to change that. So they found they found the same number of deer basically in the two areas. Um, and then they also produced a cost per deer estimate um, to see if this had worked, how much would it cost per deer to actually add harvestable animals to a population. And here in Idaho, they also, they don't have a harvest on um, antlerless deer, just on antlered males. So um, they found that it would cost almost 1600 US dollars per year to add an additional 65 yearling males to the population over 10 years. So that's almost 100,000 US dollars just to add 65 additional yearling males to the population. So not even um, really big trophy animals. And evidence from other studies also suggests that predators do not cause declines in mule deer populations in undisturbed environments, but they can prevent or uh, delay a recovery after a decline. So I'm gonna switch gears and, and talk about landscape change. And there's a whole bunch of different landscape change things I could talk about, um, but I'm just gonna focus on two with the first one being roads. So studies have found that mule deer actively avoid roads. Uh, they don't like being near them. They, yeah, they select for areas farther away from them. And then we also know from um, some work on predators, particularly from uh, the folks studying caribou, that predators will preferentially use these linear features and it gives them access to areas that perhaps they wouldn't, the predators wouldn't have gone to without the roads. And then the roads also make it easier for them to predate, predate upon um, their prey species like caribou and then also deer as well. And so when I first moved here from the US, I, I didn't really think there were a lot of roads in the Southern interior. I was just thinking about highways and to me, there's a lot more highways in the US than there are here. Um, but I, I forgot about all of the resource roads that exist in the region. And so the southern interior, it turns out, has some of the highest road densities in the whole province. And so, yeah, all of these lines on, on this figure um, are, are roads in the region. And then other work uh, has shown that the province is adding about 10,000 kilometers of roads uh, each year, which, which is a, a lot of roads. Um, so the last landscape change element I'm going to talk about is wildfire and, and wildfire suppression. So this figure shows results from a study conducted in the southern interior region of BC, uh, in which they removed a partial cross section from the trunk of alive and dead trees. And so each of those little bars on that figure shows a burn scar on a tree ring sequence. And so then based on the age of the tree, they were able to date back when those burn scars would have um, existed. And so what this figure suggests is that throughout the southern interior, small, low intensity fires were common on the landscape with um, some small, uh, high severity fires also occurring. And if you look closely at this figure, you'll also notice that after about 1950, uh, there's essentially no fire, uh, no fire rings, or excuse me, burn scars on those tree rings. Um, and so fire was essentially lost from the landscape um, in recent decades. And the reason why this could be important for mule deer and be potentially um, uh, contributing to the decline of deer is that it turns out that fire actually helps create quality forage for mule deer. So previous work has again showed that there's more plant protein and more digestible plants in burned areas. Um, and so, right, so a fire rips through an area and then the new growth that comes up afterwards could be really great forage for deer. And as I've mentioned before, forage quality is one of the main um, drivers that influences mule deer populations. And then the last thing I want to talk about briefly is winter is uh, annual weather patterns. And so unfortunately for us, we have less control over annual weather patterns than we do on some of the other things that I talked about. So not a lot of great uh, management actions here, but it's also really important to understanding um, juvenile survival. And so the the most obvious weather pattern people think of is winter severity. So if you think of a really severe winter with really deep snow and really cold temperatures, um, that can decrease overwinter fawn survival and have a and have a, quite a negative impact on the population. Um, but something that people think less about, um, but has just is just as important to uh, fawn survival in that first year is summer precipitation. So again, previous work has shown that with low summer precipitation fawns had above average mortality during the winter, even in a low snowfall winter. And if you think about this, it, it obviously makes a lot of sense. So deer are born in June and they have about until November to pack on as much weight and as much fat as they possibly can to help them make it through the winter time. And so in a really wet year where the forage is growing all, all summer long, um, there's much more food available on the landscape for these deer to eat and to, um, and to grow. 
versus if you think about some of those years where we've had really intense fires, if you think about how brown this, this second figure, the second picture would look, um, there's not a lot of food left for deer on the landscape. And so it can be more difficult for them to gain weight uh, in a really low, low uh, precipitation summer. So all of this brings us back to the overall goal of the Southern Interior Mule Deer Project. And that's really to increase mule deer population sizes in South, uh, Southern Interior British Columbia um, through an evidence-based and cooperative approach to landscape management. So we're really trying to collect the data and then have the data tell us um, what's going on with mule deer and then what can, what can we do about that moving forward. So we have three main study areas where we're conducting this research, um, the Cache Creek, West Okanagan, and Boundary Regions, which are the blue polygons. And that's where we're doing the bulk of our work. But I did want to include the East Kootenai region uh, in this figure as well, because some of you are probably aware that there's a lot of uh, mule deer research being done in the East Kootenais. Um, the, they're not collecting as much data as we are, so I can't include um, these those East Kootenai deer in all of my analyses um, because there's some differences but I did want everyone to know that we are aware of the research being done in the East Kootenais and we will try and incorporate those data as best as we can um, into into our analyses moving forward. Um, and so then one of our central hypotheses to this work is that um, these wildfires that have occurred on the landscape can be could be um, leading to increased mule deer forage on the landscape, which then could be positive for deer. So we tried to pick these areas based on the amount of recently burned land um, within them. And so you can see that obviously they have quite varying amounts of, of recent fires. So those red polygons are recent fires in the last decade. And you can see obviously the Cache Creek region has a ton of red, right? And that's the Elephant Hill fire that burned there a few years ago. Whereas in the West Okanagan and in the Boundary region, there's much less recent fires, um, but still there are some that have occurred. Um, yeah, so within these three main study areas, our goal is to maintain a sample size of 30 adult females collared in each of these regions every year, and then 20 juveniles. And so these juveniles at, at first were supposed to just be six month old fawns, so we'd have to collar 20 new fawns every year. And then this past year, we also added neonates to our to our study design. And so our goal is to have 20 neonates collared in each region as well. And at first, we were trying to color um, half of our sample in recent burns and half of our sample outside of recent burns. So we can try and get at how does um, use of recently burned land impact survival. Um, but looking at these figures, you can tell why it might be a bit difficult to catch uh, half of our deer in the burns when either there isn't very much burned land or there's perhaps too much burned land. Um, anyways, so we've been trying, but um, it's perhaps not as balanced as we would like it to be. And so if you've, if you've heard me give a talk about this before, or Adam, um, at Dr. Ford, you'll know that this uh, talk of neonates is a new addition to the project. So originally we had just planned on collaring six month old fawns. And this is mainly due to logistic and budgetary reasons. So collaring neonates can be really expensive um, because the way it's been done in the past is that you have to collar new um, adult females every year. And when you collar those adult females, you also implant something called a vaginal implant transmitter, which costs money. Um, and then that vaginal implants transmitter comes out when the deer gives birth. And then that's how we know that she's given birth. Um, and so when this project first started, the, it, it seemed like it would be too much to take on given our, our budgetary constraints and, and the, the number of people we had. Uh, so we just decided to focus on six month old fawns, which is fine because we were still gonna get that really important overwinter survival. Um, but then through some work that I've done during my master's and then also other people have done this as well, where they use uh, doe locations. So from the collared females, they use these locations to locate birth sites. And then from those birth sites, they can locate the neonates. And so this is really neat because it doesn't enable, we, uh, we don't have to have a newly collared and newly implanted batch of females every year in order to collar neonates. And so the reason why this is important for us is uh, number one, it gives us a, a more accurate estimate of first year survival and recruitment. And then it also lets us um, 
determine how maternal, winter, and summer range use can affect neonate survival. And this is because our collared neonates are associated with a collared doe, like we know who the mom is and where the mom has been. And so this is really neat because it'll enable us to figure out if there are some habitats that uh, female mule deer are using that then translate into increased neonate survival. So in terms of capture, uh, we first started this project in March of 2018 when we caught our first batch of adult females. And then we've continued catching them every winter thereafter. Um, so that, that should say November 2018, because we, we started again in November of 2018, 2019, 2020, and then we have one more year in 2021. Um, and then for six month old fawns, again, we started catching those in 2018. Uh, 2019 was our second year, and then this upcoming year is our third and final year of catching six-month-old fawns. And so we try to color these in November and December of every year, so that way we can, um, we can catch them at the start of winter, put a collar on them, and then see if they live or die throughout the winter, right? It doesn't really make sense to catch them in March, uh, because then you're already catching the ones that have, have lived to March. Um, yeah, and then neonates, uh, so we did a pilot study in June of 2019. Um, because this method of using doe locations to locate neonates uh, was relatively new and we didn't know if it would if it would work, uh, quite frankly, if we had the manpower to make it work. But the pilot study went really well in 2019. So then this last June in 2020, um, we went full steam ahead and tried to catch our, our full sample of 20 neonates in each region. And then we do have one more neonate capture season coming up and that's um, this coming June in 2020. So the way we catch adult, uh, adults and then six month old fawns in the wintertime, um, we have three main methods. The first of which is helicopter net gunning. So the helicopter um, buzzes around, they find uh, an adult or a fawn, um, and then the gunner shoots, uh, shoots a net out at the deer. The deer gets tangled and then the helicopter lands and everyone gets out, untangles the deer, hobbles, puts a blindfold on and then, and then works up the deer that way. And so helicopter net gunning is the most um, efficient way to catch these deer. You can catch many deer in one day, uh, but it's also the most expensive method. So obviously flying around in a helicopter is not a cheap activity. Um, so this is where we use uh, quite a bit of money is using these helicopters. And so generally we run out of money before we catch all of our deer. So then we rely on our other methods. Um, the first one being uh, ground darting. And so the way ground darting works is we just drive around and have a, have a um, dart gun that looks like a hunting rifle, but instead of shooting bullets, it shoots um, tranquilizer darts. And so we have to be within 30 yards of the deer, and it shoots a tranquilizer dart into the rump of the deer. And then about five minutes later, excuse me, she falls asleep, and then we can, uh, we can work up the deer. And you'll notice in these pictures, the deer are not hobbled, and that's because they're chemically immobilized, right? So they're just, they're just peaceful and sleeping. Um, yeah, but sometimes it can be tricky to get within 30 yards of a deer to shoot them. Uh, so then when that doesn't work or uh, on other days, we use clover traps. And so clover traps are more of a passive trapping method. Um, and they're just these netted cages that you see in the picture here. And so it doesn't look high tech, uh, but they do work. And so what we do is we set big piles of apples out. And then once the deer are used to eating those apples, we place a trap on, on top. And then the deer are generally hungry enough to go and investigate. And so what they do is they walk inside the trap to eat these apples. And then they hit a tripwire and the door closes. And they're a bit startled at first. They're wondering why they're a bit stuck. Um, but then they usually just go right back to eating. And so we've put these, uh, we've put cameras on quite a few of these traps. And this is pretty typical. Um, the deer are a bit startled at first after the door closes. Um, but once they realize they're trapped, they just eat the rest of the apples and then they take a nap until we get there. And so we check these traps um, every day and sometimes twice a day, depending on the weather. But generally, if we check the weather forecast and it's going to be very cold that night, uh, we generally don't set the traps. Um, so we don't trap when it's really cold outside because uh, we, we don't want anyone to get hurt, um, our deer. So then when we get there the next morning and we see that there's a deer in the trap, we run as fast as we can uphill through the snow um, to, get to, these, to get to these deer. And so once we get there, we, um, we collapse the trap, they fold sideways, it's kind of goofy, but, um, and then the deer gets restrained underneath the trap. 
And then the, the most exciting part is trying to hobble and blindfold the deer to get them out so that they're safely restrained. Um, but what, once that's been done, and no matter how we caught this, these deer, whether it's the helicopter, the dart gun, or the clover trap, we do all of the same methods, all the same on sampling methods going forward. So the first thing we do is draw blood and that blood can tell us um, pregnancy of the deer. So there's something called pregnancy specific protein B and um, depending on the levels of that protein in the blood, we can tell if she's pregnant or not. We also collect hair, a fecal sample, and then if there's ticks, we, we collect them and then we also make note of them. So you can see this deer had uh, quite, quite a bad tick infestation on her one year. And then we also do a bunch of morphometric measurements. So this is uh, right here, Andrew's taking a total body length. Um, we also do chest girth, hind foot lengths, um, and perhaps there's one more that I'm forgetting. And then we also put an ear tag in and take a weight, which is a great time to work on your, uh, your squats. And so we do collar six month old fawns that are males, just because it uh, can be really tricky if, you're only try if you are only collar females. Um, anyways, so it is possible one day that you might harvest a male deer that has one of these ear tags in. Uh, the male collars fall off before the female collars do um, to avoid having them, the collars be too small for their necks. Uh, so anyways, if you end up harvesting a deer that has one of these ear tags in, um, give RAF a call and then there's a unique number on the back and they will send that number off to me and then I can give you more information about, about that deer. And so then another thing we do is we use these portable ultrasounds that were graciously donated to us by um, some BC Wildlife Federation clubs. And um, they're quite expensive, uh, so we're really grateful for that. Um, but one of the things these ultrasounds lets us do is actually count the number of fetuses within a doe. Uh, so we just shave a little piece of her belly and then use the ultrasound to try and count the fetuses. And so you can see in this picture here, um, that's the spine in the rib cage of one deer. Um, and then we usually root around uh, and moving the, the transducer as much as possible to try and find the second neonate, uh, the second fetus, excuse me. And, um, and then we count whether we saw one or two. And I will say when we do this, um, I'm always quite uh, conservative in whether I say that she had twins or one. So I only mark down that she had twins if I am 100% sure that I saw two different fetuses in there uh, as opposed to just one, because they are, they, they are easy to miss. Um, and this is one of my favorite things to do. I just think it's really neat um, to see these little fetuses inside. And then another thing we do with the ultrasound that's also really important is get an objective measure of body condition by measuring the rump fat on the deer. And so perhaps you've worked on other projects or you've, um, you've seen results from other projects where they just palpated the, the animal or you know just feel the rump and the withers and then give the deer a, a score from like zero to five with five being really fat and zero being really skinny. And so this can work, but the problem is that it is really subjective based on the observer. So I might give something a four and then uh, somebody else might give it a four and a half or a five. But what the ultrasound lets us do is actually measure the amount of rump fat on that deer, which is then just a number, an amount of fat um, that can't really be argued with or isn't um, subjective. So this is really important as well, because as I mentioned, when I talked about um, uh, weather, weather variation and how weather patterns can influence survival. Um, it's really important to know uh, what their body condition is going into winter to see if they'll, if they'll make it out of winter. Okay, so now I'm going to switch gears and talk about how we catch neonates. And so this is quite a bit different than how we catch the six month old fawns and the adults. Uh, and that's partially because of, uh, well, the time of year and also their defense mechanisms. So neonate deer for the first week or two of life are incredibly helpless. They can't outrun predators. Um, yeah, so basically all they do is they just sit and they're quiet and they just hope to avoid capture. And so this makes them really um, quite uh, calm to work with uh, because they don't struggle and, and you're not in danger of getting whacked in the face with a leg. Um, yeah, but the tricky part is finding them um, because it is kind of like searching for a needle in a haystack. So what this picture here shows us is a doe's locations from this summer, and these are hourly locations over a two day period. And so each of those dots represents one location. And so you can see that this deer has moved uh, a decent amount in two days. Um, 
yeah, she, maybe she stops for a couple hours in one place, but then picks up and, and moves over again. And so what we do during the summer at the beginning of June uh, last year and the year before was for all of our, our females that were old enough to be pregnant, um, we monitored their movements every single day. And so if we saw movements that looked like this, we'd say, okay, uh, I don't think this deer is pregnant. She's moving quite a bit. And so, you know, we'll check on her tomorrow. And then let's say the next day, I saw locations that looked like this. And so you can see obviously quite a reduction in movements between the two slides. And so this is also a two day time period, but you can see that she hasn't left that little cluster. And I would like to point out that those dots that are far away and then come right back, those are likely just collar error. Um, it, this area was quite cliffy. It doesn't really look like it from, from Google Earth. Um, but anyways, and so sometimes the collar can have a bit of, a bit of trouble actually trying to uh, take a location. So anyways, those are likely error. And then if you don't look at those, you can just see that this deer hasn't left this one little area. And the, the reason that this happens is for a number of reasons. One of them is obviously when the deer is giving birth, um, they can't, um, uh, they, they don't move very much, right? Because they're in the process of giving birth. And then the second thing is that it's also an anti-predator defense. So other work from particularly the, uh, the prairies in Alberta, they've shown that deer, um, uh, mule deer in, in particular, can actually chase coyotes away from their neonates. And so they'll see a coyote coming close to where their neonate is, and then the doe will like attack that, that neonate, or attack that coyote. And so it's an anti-predator defense. Um, and then also, obviously, the, the moms have to be close by in order to nurse their, in order to nurse their neonates, so they're not going to go very far. So this reduction in movements is incredibly typical, and this is what we look for. And so we would see this, this cluster of, of locations, and then we'd say to ourselves, okay, we're going to go there and we're going to go look for a neonate. And so the way this works is then we go out there and you never know what you're going to find. Sometimes we've had some quite nice walks through grassy hillsides and um, sometimes tall grass and fresh cut blocks and all sorts of places. And we get in a line of anywhere from three to 10 people. The more people you have, the better. And you just get in a line where you're pretty close to each other and you grid search. So you just go back and forth and back and forth throughout that cluster until you locate the neonate. And so, yeah, sometimes you never know what you're gonna walk through. Sometimes it's really nice. And then every once in a while you end up in kind of a disaster like this where the mom has decided to give birth in probably the most blow down or down trees I've, I've ever walked over in my life. Um, but hopefully you're lucky while you're out there and you actually spot the neonate. Uh, and then it's quite exciting. It doesn't matter what you've walked through, you're always excited to find the neonate. And so um, there's actually one in this picture here. And then when we find the neonate, the first thing we do is we weigh it. Uh, and then we put the collar on because the collar is the most important thing. It tells us, because uh, obviously that's what's gonna monitor its survival and movements. And then we also take a couple morphometric measurements. So looking at hind, hind foot length and total body length and stuff. But what we don't do to these neonates is we don't put in ear tags, we don't take fecal samples, and we don't do blood, we don't draw blood. So we don't do any of the really invasive things that we do to the older deer. Um, yeah, so then the next thing I wanted to just briefly mention, because I think it's kind of interesting, is just the different places where we found these neonates. Um, some of them were born right in the middle of pretty fresh cut blocks, so these must have just been uh, cut like that that year. Uh, and then, you know, the neonates were just out there. And so that's really interesting, um, these three. And then we also found some really far away from cut blocks. So this neonate on the far left, uh, that's actually snow in the back of that picture. And it was four degrees and raining when we went and found this neonate uh, in mid-June. And so this mom gave birth way up a uh, high elevation site near the Granby Provincial Park. And then if you contrast that to other uh, places, so this, this deer in the middle, she was born right uh, on the hills. It's like called Ingram. It's right in the boundary there along Highway 3. And so really low elevation, close to people's homes, close to a major road, uh, much warmer than where the other neonate was born. And then this other one on the far right is my favorite neonate we've ever caught um, just because I was, we were very excited just to actually find this deer. But again, this deer was born quite far from a road uh, and quite far from an actual cut block. And yes, those are mosquitoes in front of us. Um, that was uh, it was quite a walk in the woods that day, um, but really happy to have found that neonate. So then um, the different we put on different collars depending on the age of the deer. 
So our adults get the heaviest collars, they weigh 650 grams and they have twice as much battery life as the six month old fawn collars. Those weigh 450 grams. And then the neonate collars only weigh about 140 grams. And so the adult collars will never come off that deer. That's a, a neoprene um, encasing or a belt, I should say. And um, that's because adult females, their neck sizes don't grow. So once they're an adult, their neck size is the same. So there's no need for any elastic in that um, collar. And we want them to stay on as long as possible because it's really important to monitor those animals for a long time. Whereas the, the six month old fawn collars in the center, those have uh, elastic um, at the top, you can see, and so that expands. And so that way, when we put the, the collar on as a fawn, by the time they get to be an adult, that collar will, will still fit them because of that elastic. And then that elastic will rot and fall off. And um, then for the, the six month old fawns that are males, we put on a little rot off strip, as I mentioned before. And so those will rot off within a year, whereas the female ones will last a little bit longer um, just because their necks don't get as big as the males. And then the neonate collars are, are quite completely different. Um, they're much smaller and their entire band is just a piece of elastic and the elastic is then sewn a, kind of like an accordion with stitches that hold them together. And so then as the deer grows, those stitches come undone, the accordion uh, comes undone and then, and then it's a bigger collar. And so then it, it grows with the deer essentially. And that collar uh, will only last about a year before that, um, before that elastic will completely rot and fall off the deer. And so uh, the adult and six month old fawn collars take a location every four hours and 15 minutes, and then they send a location to my computer uh, after it's taken four of those locations. So every about 16 to 17 hours, I get an update of locations for those deer. Um, the neonate collars, because they're much smaller, they function in a different way. They're not quite as high tech. They only send a location once a day. Um, but they are actually taking fixes every two hours, but they just get stored onto that, onto the collar. And so I actually have to get the collar back in my hand uh, in order to get the rest of that location information. Whereas for the adults and the six month old fawns, if we never saw those collars again, um, that would be okay because we get all of that data. Um, yeah, and then the neonate collars, we, the reason we always weigh the neonates first is because we want to make sure that the neonate weighs enough to, to wear that collar. Um, so we, we never weigh them if they're, if they're quite small, uh, or we don't collar them if they're quite small because we don't want the collar to be too heavy. And then another thing what these collars have is uh, a mortality notification. And so when the collars have been stationary between four and six hours, so the neonate collars are four hours, the other collars are six hours. Um, when they've been stationary for that long, I get a text message and an email and it alerts us that, hey, something is, has gone wrong, likely this deer is dead because it's been stationary for so long. And then we go out and we try to get to the site within 48 hours of getting that notification. And, um, and then when we get to the site, we try to figure out what killed it. And so perhaps in this picture, this is a mortality investigation I went to over a year ago now, but there's actually deer in this picture. Um, and this is a pretty typical cougar kill. So it's been cached quite clearly underneath um, these, these sticks and leaves and things, which is a quite, a quite a cat thing to do. And then we also found some cougar scat nearby. So once we know what's killed it, um, and again, this was pretty clearly a cougar, um, then we collect the, the head and the femur. And so the femur, lets us um, at a later date we go back to the lab and we'll open that femur and we'll actually get a measurement of the amount of marrow fat or bone marrow within that deer and so that gives us kind of a crude estimate of body condition at birth or excuse me at death <laughs> um, and then we also take the head so we need the jaw in order to send the teeth off for aging so deer teeth are kind of like a, um, a, a tree in the sense that they can be sliced open and then you can count the rings in the tooth and it'll tell you how old that deer was when it died. Uh, and then we also collect the head um, because we send the rest of the head off to the provincial wildlife health lab and they, um, they send it off to look for CWD. Uh, but sometimes a deer dies and we have no idea why, uh, just by looking at the carcass. So you can see this deer here, she was just lying dead in the grass and you can see, you know, some some wounds on her side, but nothing that looked um, fatal to us. And so this deer was quite close to a road. And so if they are close to a road, 
we'll drag them back to the truck and then take them back to the lab where we can do an actual necropsy. And so this year we, um, yeah, we took back to the lab, uh, cut open, and then we'll take a look at all the organs and stuff and just see if there's any underlying health issues. And apologize if you're eating, um, but this is what we found when we opened her up, right? So those are her lungs. Uh, well, you can't see them because they're underneath quite a thick layer of pus. And so this deer died of bacterial pneumonia infection. Um, and so if we get out there and the deer is really far from a road and we can't drag it, drag it back to the truck or to the lab, we will do a field necropsy as well. Um, and we, we have had to do that a couple of times. So, yeah. Um, okay, so now we will move on to some results. Uh, and so, so I, I mentioned that we started catching adults in the spring of 2018 uh, in the Okanagan that March, we caught 11 adults in the boundary 21 and in Cache Creek, we caught 32 adults. And again, our goal was to have 30 collared per year in each region. So we really only reached this goal in Cache Creek, um, but that's okay because that winter we set out and started our first fawn capture as well as continued to catch adults. And so in the Okanagan, we caught 24 adults and 20 fawns. In the boundary, we caught 16 adults and 18 fawns. And in Cache Creek, we only caught seven fawns. Um, so again, our goal was 20 fawns. We got close in the Okanagan and the boundary, but not so much in Cache Creek. They were a little tricky. Um, but then we learned our lesson. And so this last winter, winter of 1920, um, we reached our sample of fawns in, in pretty much every region. And so we do have one more, one more winter of fawn capture and adult capture to go, and that's this winter um, of 2020 and 2021. And so we have caught a total of 232 deer in the last two and a half years uh, that are six month olds or adults. Um, and then in terms of neonates, so summer 2019 was our first uh, pilot study, and our goal was just to catch four neo, or excuse me, five neonates in the Okanagan and five in Cache Creek. And you can see here that we, we did that. And in fact, we exceeded our goal in the Okanagan. So then last year, uh, this past summer, we set out to do our big um, coloring effort. And again, we exceeded our expectations or met them in some areas. Uh, so we caught a total of 61 neonates this past summer. Um, yeah, and reached our goal in every, in every study area. So right now we currently have 143 deer that are wearing collars that are alive right now. So in the Okanagan we have 38 female adults, nine yearlings, and five neonates. In the boundary we have 33 females, uh, adult females, 13 yearlings, and five neonates. And in Cache Creek, 27 adults, nine yearlings, and four neonates. So in terms of pregnancy results um, of the deer that we caught, uh, that were caught far enough after conception, um, because if you catch a deer in, in December or in November, uh, it's still too close to conception for even the blood test to tell if they're pregnant. But of those deer that we caught um, January and onwards, 93% uh, of the adults were pregnant, and at least 69% of those females were carrying twins. And then during neonate capture, we found twins 46% of the time. And so that doesn't mean that there's a discrepancy between the um, the ultrasound and then and then the, the capture stuff uh, or, or that we're doing something wrong but what it likely is is that during neonate capture it's possible that if we only found one it doesn't mean the twin didn't exist we could have just been bad at looking and and missed the twin uh, and then it's also possible if we got there two or three days after birth it's possible that one of the twins had already died and so we only found the surviving animal um, but if we compare these to twinning rates elsewhere, we can see that we kind of, that with 70% uh, of our does carrying twins, our twinning rates are really comparable to other regions um, and actually a bit higher than in some places. And then in terms of rump fat, I don't really have any amazing results or groundbreaking things to share with you, but I did just want to show you how important that rump fat is uh, for deer over the winter time. So this is a deer that we caught on December 5th. And you can see that dotted line right there, that's all measurable rump fat. And so that is, that's a lot, and that's quite a few centimeters of rump fat. And then this is a different deer that we caught on January 30th. And again, that dotted line between the two A's and like crosshairs, that's the amount of measurable rump fat on that deer. And so the scale of these two pictures is the same. Uh, and you can see that there's much less uh, measurable rump fat on this, this deer caught at the end of January. And then if we look at a deer we caught on March 3rd, uh, there is absolutely no measurable rump fat on this deer at all. 
And so that doesn't mean that she was starving or about to die. Uh, it just means that there's no measurable rump fat left and she does still have a little bit left, but her body fat levels are less than 4%. Um, and so you can see, although these are three different deer, uh, just you can look at this and see and say, okay, they are using quite a lot of rump fat over the winter time. And so yes, it is very important um, to understand their body condition going into winter because that should tell us uh, how likely they are to actually make it through the winter. And then first, just I'm going to give a little summary of survival results before I actually get into the, the details. So annual adult survival differed by region, but not by year. And so if you remember all the way to the beginning of this talk, um, I did mention that annual adult survival is generally high and, and constant between years, which is um, mostly what we observed. But we found that overwinter fawn survival differed by region and by year. So again, as at the beginning of the talk, I also mentioned that fawns, um, their survival is much lower and much more variable and uh, between years, and that's what we saw as well. And then neonate survival, we really only have one year of data for that, uh, but it was different by region. Uh, we pulled the 11 neonates caught in the summer of 2019 into this survival analysis uh, because 11 neonates is, is too few to really make any um, make any concrete uh, uh, results out of. So this figure here shows um, annual adult survival in the West Okanagan. So the x-axis just shows um, survival between that's April and March of every year, the end of March. Uh, and you can see that within a year, the annual adult survival is 86%. Um, the the y-axis does stop at 40%, so it looks lower than it is. But yeah, it's 86% in the Okanagan. In the Cache Creek, it's identical. Um, it's 86% in Cache Creek. Um, and then we look at our friends in the Boundary Region, and it is a bit lower. It's only 72% within that year. And so if we compare these to other regions, so in the West Kootenays in the early 90s, excuse me, late 90s and early 2000s, um, adult survival there was 72%. And in their region compared uh, combined with their fawn survival, uh, their population was declining with an adult survival of 72%. But um, in Idaho in 2011, their adult survival was 89%. And then there was a literature review of all mule deer studies that was conducted in 2013. And the average adult survival that they found in that, uh, in that study was uh, 84%. And so you can see that in the Okanagan and the Cache Creek, our adult survivals are really comparable to these other populations that are doing really, really well. Um, whereas in the boundary, that 72% is, is a bit low. Um, and then it, yeah. So this is um, overwinter fawn survival in the West Okanagan. So this is from December until April. Uh, no, excuse me, December until the beginning of June uh, in 2018 and 2019. And in the West Okanagan, it was 48%. So 48% of the deer we collared in December uh, made it through the winter until June. And in Cache Creek, uh, so this figure basically doesn't matter because again, we only collared seven deer this that year. Uh, so these confidence intervals are huge and it's a bit of a goofy looking graph. So there's less information in, in this figure. Uh, and then in the boundary region, yikes, those, those poor guys that year had a pretty low uh, overwinter fawn survival of only 27%. So only 27% of the deer we caught in December were alive in June. Um, and if we compare these numbers to other studies in other regions, um, in Idaho, their overwinter survival was 56%. In Colorado, it was 53%. And in an overall mule deer, uh, that review paper that I talked about, uh, it was 61%. And so in the West Okanagan and Cache Creek that year, or really just the West Okanagan, um, pretty similar, a, a bit lower than 56%, but the confidence intervals do include that number. Uh, whereas in the boundary, 27% um, is a bit on the low end. So then we move to, um, to this past winter, which was 2019 and 2020. And we can see in the Okanagan, um, overwinter survival was pretty similar to the previous year. It was 53%. In Cache Creek, it was 55%, so we had much better estimates this past winter because we actually caught all the deer we were supposed to. Uh, and then you might be thinking to yourself, oh boy, I bet the, the fawns in the boundary have just, I bet they did terrible last year too. But um, no, they shocked us all. And in the boundary, they actually had some of the highest uh, fawn survival over the winter that we've seen at 83%. And so 
I don't know why this is the case yet. This is what I'm hoping to work towards in, in the next couple of years is try to figure out what is driving these differences, these yearly differences in fawn survival, and is there anything we can do about that? Um, but I think it's important to just keep in mind that, you know, maybe one winter would be really bad for fawn survival and you might think, oh, the population's doomed. Um, but really, you never know what's going to happen the next year. And yeah, the last year in the boundary, we had really high survival. And so that brings us to neonate survival. And so this figure is a little bit different because it actually shows neonate survival to 12 weeks of age. So this is, uh, they're caught at zero weeks of age. And then um, in the West Okanagan, we saw that 46% of those deer made it until 12 weeks of age. Um, and in Cache Creek, it was really similar. 12 week neonate survival was 44%. And in the boundary region, it was 29%, so a little bit lower in the boundary than in these other two regions. And you can see that a lot of this mortality happened, like the, start, the steepest decline in this figure um, is before four weeks old. And this makes sense, and it's what other studies have seen as well. And that's because in those first four weeks of life, the deer are incredibly helpless. They can't, un they can't outrun predators, and so they just have to, um, they, they're basically like sitting ducks, and they, they get eaten. Um, but I also wanted to mention that these, these numbers look alarming, right? You might say to yourself like, oh wow, in 12 weeks we're already losing half of the deer that were already born on the landscape. And that's true, but that's also been found in many other studies. So in Colorado, their 12-week neonate survival rate was 48%. In Idaho, it's 45%. In California, on average, it was 33%. And so all of these places have really similar predator assemblages to ours. And so there's a lot of predators out there trying to eat the deer. Um, but yeah, there's other studies that had similarly low neonate survival. Um, it didn't translate into a declining, into a declining population. Um, it's then what happens over the winter time that's also really important as well, and then uh, combined with adult survival. So all of these pieces kind of come together, and you know, just having a neonate survival of 29% doesn't necessarily mean that the population is declining. And then it's also really interesting to point out that um, so everywhere that I mentioned, yeah, had similar predator assemblages, but there was a study on white-tailed deer neonates in Delaware, which is on the east coast of the U.S. And uh, in Delaware, they have absolutely no predators. They have no bobcats, they have no coyotes, they have nothing. And they collared uh, white-tailed deer neonates and they found that their survival through the summer was also only 44%. So even in a place with no predators at all, um, you can still lose over half of the deer uh, in that summer. And most of their deer died of disease as opposed to obviously there's no predators. So then in terms of mortality sources, we've had 83 mortalities that we've investigated. Um, 60 of those are due to predation and 23 of those are from other, um, a couple of unknowns, some, some vehicle, things like that. But overwhelmingly, you can see that cougars are the number one cause of mortality for deer in our study. Uh, and also something new this year that if you've seen me give a talk before, um, you would know that previously we saw no wolf predation at all. But this past winter, we did have five wolf mortalities uh, on fawns in the Cache Creek region, and then actually one in the Okanagan as well. So we are seeing more wolves than we have in previous years, but it's still um, nothing compared to the cougar mortality. But what I would like to say about this slide also is what I don't want you to take away from it is that, oh, obviously we just need to kill all the cougars and then, you know, then everything will be fine. The deer will come back. And we don't know this, right? So we don't know. So we have seen more cougar uh, predation in the boundary than in other regions, but we don't know if there are more cougars in the boundary than in other places, or if maybe there's something about the boundary, something about the habitat or the roads or the weather, anything, we don't know if that's what's leading to have uh, more cougar predations in that region than in other places. So anyways, just something to keep in mind and something we're going to try and tease apart moving forward is, is the problem that there are too many cougars or is there some other underlying problem um, that's influencing adult, female, and fawn survival. So in terms of mortality sources for neonates, so that last slide was just for six-month-old fawns and adults. Um, for neonates, uh, bears, black bears was our number one identifiable cause of mortality. There's at least 13, but probably 18. And uh, one of the reasons we were able to determine that bears killed a lot of these things was because bears are pretty obvious. Um, they poo all over the place. And so that really helps when it comes to determining what, what killed the deer. Um, and then 
but you'll notice that uh, there's 15 unknowns. So quite a few of our, our deer that died, we had no idea what killed them. And you might think, wow, you guys suck at this. Like, how could you not tell? Um, and that's because no matter how fast we got there, some of the mortalities, all we found was a pile of bone fragments and a collar and that's it. And so then because there's no snow, um, there's no tracks, there's no scat, it's almost impossible to figure out what killed this deer uh, if all you find is that, that picture on the right. Um, and so it is possible that uh, there's another predator that's consuming other that's consuming deer on the landscape uh, as neonates, or these could even be health related as well, and then that were scavenged later on. Um, we don't know that. Um, but anyways, and then we also found um, one stillborn deer, just in case you were wondering. Um, we visited many different birth sites and only found one, uh, one stillborn. And then in terms of the collar data, so we've collected almost 700,000 locations in the last two and a half years. And if you have ever worked with VHF telemetry data before, you know that this is really an impressive number. Uh, and really we owe it all to those, those GPS collars that are really great and really um, yeah, groundbreaking in terms of the data they can provide us. And then on average, we have about 2,000 locations per deer. Obviously the adults have many more locations uh, than the neonates, but um, on average, that's what we've seen. And then of the deer that we've collared, 75% um, of those are migratory. And in general, spring migration starts in mid-May and ends in late May, whereas fall migration starts in early October and ends in mid-October. And the migrations tend to happen pretty quickly, sometimes a week, sometimes two weeks. Um, and then we have seen you know, some variation by study area and year. I didn't want to just put in here a bunch of dates because that gets it's not very exciting. Um, but anyway, some of our earliest migrations are seen in the Cache Creek region, particularly coming back into winter range. Um, and then some of our longest time, time like temporal migrations are um, in the boundary because some of these deer use stopover sites. So in the, the fall, they'll come back down and then they'll actually spend a month or two in a stopover site before heading all the way back down into their, um, uh, into their winter range. And then, so on average, um, the shortest distance migrations occur in the Okanagan at only 43 kilometers. In Cache Creek in the boundary, they're identical. The average distance is 58 kilometers. Um, and then in terms of the maximum distances we've seen are all pretty comparable. So in the West Okanagan, the longest migration was 96 kilometers. In Cache Creek, it was 107 kilometers. And in the boundary, it's 118 kilometers. And so here's just, these are two deer. The purple one is the one that migrated the farthest. That's 118 kilometers. Um, and then the yellow one is still pretty close. I think it was like 100, 110 or something. Um, anyways, I drive quite frequently between Kelowna and Rock Creek. And that drive in my car takes me like an hour and 45 minutes and feels like it takes forever. But these deer are essentially walking from Rock Creek uh, all the way to the same latitude as Lake Country. And these deer also do it while they're pregnant because they give birth um, after they migrate. And so all of this just collectively blows my mind um, because that's such a far distance to walk, um, especially while heavily pregnant. Uh, these aren't the longest mule deer migrations by far. So the longest mule deer migration on record is 410 kilometers in Wyoming. Um, and so these are obviously not even close to that, but these are still, still quite far and they're still traversing quite a distance. And then I'm just gonna show, hopefully these work. Let me make sure. Yes, okay, great. So what this figure is, this is a, a movement video um, and all of these little dots are different deer. Um, and then you can see, so up here, this is the uh, Cash Creek region. This is the West Okanagan and this is the boundary. And so this is gonna show you spring migrations in our three study areas. So the time up here is at the top. This is um, for, yeah, April 16th and then moving forward. And so we'll see the deer move. Um, so you can see kind of mid-April, we start to see a little bit of movement to their summer ranges, um, but not a ton. Uh, by beginning of May, we start to see more deer moving, particularly in the Okanagan, in Cache Creek. And then really in the boundary picks up at the end of May, um, whereas everybody else in the Okanagan and Cache Creek are kind of already in their, um, in their summer ranges. Right, okay, so, um, and we'll move on. So this is the, this is the same figure, the same picture. Uh, so again, this is Cache Creek. This is the West Okanagan. This is the boundary. Um, oh, hold on. I didn't go far enough ahead. There we go. Uh, the same thing, but in, in the fall. 
Uh, so this is going to start in um, September uh, and then we'll move forward in time. And so we can see, yeah, mid-September, some of the deer are starting to come back, particularly in the Cache Creek region, a couple in the boundary, um, but it really picks up at the end of September slash beginning of October. Um, and then we'll see a big pulse coming up here, yeah, mid-October. And this year, that I think was when we got that first big snowfall in the Okanagan, and you can see those deer coming back. Um, yeah, a couple of stragglers there at the end of October. And then that brings us to, um, yeah, like two days ago. And so you can see these deer right here. This is kind of like Gladstone Provincial Park area. Um, these deer are the ones that I was talking about that use those stopover sites. And so they will spend their whole, um, they'll spend about a month or two there, and then they'll finally come back um, in, in January to their winter range. Okay, so uh, one more note about the migration, something else that we've seen that's really cool um, is that they have really high site fidelity to their migration pathways. So this is one deer, this is two spring migrations and two fall migrations. The different colors are the different um, seasons and years. And you can see that every season and year, she basically steps right on top of the place that she walked um, six months before that. And so I know for me, when I go walk around in the bush, if when I leave my car and when I come back to my car, I never take the same route in. And so obviously the deer spend way more time uh, out in the woods than I do. And so they're much more familiar with these routes. But I still think it's incredibly interesting to see um, how much they stick to these pathways. And so this uh, also has really important conservation implications, right? What happens if we build a wall or build a massive road right through this uh, migration? What would happen? Uh, and the answer is we don't really know. Um, but just something uh, to keep in mind. And then I've been blathering on here for almost an hour and I haven't once mentioned camera traps. So all I've talked about is the collar data. Um, but the camera traps are a really, really important piece of this puzzle that will help give more context to, to the results that we're showing. So again, when I talked about um, cougar predation and how cougars are the number one source of mortality for our deer, uh, we have no idea if that's just because there's more predators or more cougars in one area than another. And that's where these camera traps, that's one of the pieces of information that they'll provide to us. So they won't be able to give us um, exact predator densities, but they will tell us if there's relatively more cougars in one area than another. And then beyond just telling us about predators, they also tell us about every other animal that's out there that can be um, have a picture taken of it. And so I'm not going to talk any more about camera traps um, because that is the work of Sam Foster, a PhD student at the University of Idaho, who is also an integral part of the Sing Deer project. And so hopefully you've all had the pleasure of meeting Sam and working with him. Um, but if you live in one of our study areas or close by and you're interested in helping to volunteer to put cameras out or to retrieve cameras, um, we could always use the help. It's uh, one of the, the most logistically complex and time consuming things that we do. And Sam is a master at uh, organizing all of that. So if you're interested, please email Sam. And then uh, Sam will be giving a webinar in January of 21 um, in which he will tell you more about the cameras and what they do. And then, yeah, just briefly, I want to talk about all the things that I still have left to do. So we still have one more winter of fawn and adult capture, as I've mentioned, that's coming up. That's in this. It actually starts like next week uh, 20, uh, for 2020 and 21. And then potentially we might have one more winter of adult capture uh, next winter, so 21 and 22. Um, but that really depends on funding. And then we have one more summer of neonate capture coming up in 2021. Um, and then, yeah, continual mortality investigation. So over the next few years, as these deer uh, continue to die, um, we will be out there trying to figure out what killed them as fast as we can. And then for me, uh, so I have just this one last bit of field work to do, and then I start transitioning really into the heart of the data analysis. So I have a lot of to data to wade through, a lot of really important questions to answer, and hopefully I'll have, yeah, more exciting results for you guys in the coming years. And so hopefully I will be Dr. Wright by the fall of 2022, um, and I will have, uh, yeah, I'll have some more information. And we will continue to give these updates um, about once a year. Uh, well, maybe webinars once a year and then more frequent um, written updates. And uh, yeah, we'll just, we'll keep you guys posted as things go on and as I start really getting to work on these data. Um, so with that, I'd like to thank every single organization that's on this slide. Um, they've either given us money 
or manpower or lots of both. And so we really, really appreciate that. Um, truly, this project could not happen without, without everyone listed on this slide. Uh, alternatively, if you're listening and you're a part of an organization that doesn't have a logo or name on this slide, uh, please send me an email because I really want to make sure that everyone gets the recognition that they deserve for the hard work that they've put into this um, collaborative project. Um, so yeah, so thanks to everyone on this slide. And then I just want to share one more slide, which was pointed out that I didn't have during the um, during the webinar. Uh, these are the references for some of the studies or most of the studies that I referenced in this presentation. So if you're interested in reading more and really delving into the literature on mule deer, there's so much good work that's been done. Um, so you feel free to Google these. If the if the papers are behind a paywall, so if you have to pay to read them, please send me an email and I will send you the um, I'll send you the papers, so please don't pay for them. I am happy to send those to you. Um, so with that, I am finally done. Um, I hope you all learned something. And again, if you have a question, please feel free to send me an email and I will try my, my hardest to, to give you a satisfactory answer.